<laughs> okay. So um, welcome, Brian. Thanks for being here. So Brian is a, he's actually from Chicago. He is a proud uh, husband and soon to be father. He is an HR professional and um, yeah, a friend of mine. And so uh, thanks for being here, Brian. Yeah, absolutely. So Sarah and Courtney, thank you guys, first of all, for having me. What you guys are, are doing here is pretty amazing. And, uh, you know, I've listened to all the discussions over the last few weeks and uh, you learn something new each time. So I, I think this is great and great opportunity for people in the area to, to learn something. So, um, you know, I've had several conversations with Sarah as well as her husband, Jeremy, about uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. So, you know, it meant a lot when you guys asked me to come on this morning. I, I really appreciate it. Um, also want to give a shout out to the mixed staffing team. Um, they've actually been helping provide temporary workers project that we're working on at Hex Armor right now. Um, you know, they've been involved in, in helping staff up a project that's been an absolute beast and they've, they've done an unbelievable job. So thank you guys for that. Uh, but really wanted to start by just sharing a little bit about my background. It, it's a little bit unique, um, my family history. Uh, grew up with two loving parents, suburbs of Chicago, you know, played sports all my life. Uh, my dad was my coach growing up, especially in baseball. Ended up going off to college on a, a scholarship to Southern Illinois. Uh, two years, a couple injuries and circumstances later, ended up transferring to Marquette. It's a little bit of a blessing in disguise because I did end up meeting my wife there. Uh, moved to Grand Rapids, which is where she's from three years ago. Uh, you know, now work for work in HR for a great company, Hex Armor, and really consider myself extremely, you know, fortunate for the opportunities that I've I've been given throughout my life. Uh, if anyone watched a couple of weeks ago on the discussion, uh, Myra Karras, he was on and he he said something that you know, kind of resonated with me. He, he mentioned that he's felt like he's almost benefited from white privilege in some way. And I, I thought that was interesting that he said that because, you know, after thinking about it, I, I feel the same way. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, fitting in white culture um, in order to, I guess, not necessarily move up in your career, but in some ways move up in your career for one, just to fit in with the culture and, uh, you know, it's a thing that before, you know, the last month, I, you know, it was just kind of natural to me, you know, just how I, I grew up and just my family background and, you know, how I was raised. Um, but, you know, now's the time, you know, I'm sitting here today, first time kind of speaking out about my experience, because, you know, I've quickly realized that, you know, not everyone has the same opportunities. Um, so just to go back, um, as for my ethnicity, like I said, it's a little bit of a, a unique background. Both my parents are French Creole. Uh, for those of you that really don't know what French Creole is, it's a mix of French, Spanish, African, Native American ancestry, um, really stemming from the Louisiana area. Uh, the unique thing about Creole is that, you know, I have relatives of all shades. So I have some, you know, cousins that walk into the sun for an hour and they turn into a tomato. I've got others that, you know, have a complexion that's, you know, similar, similar to mine or darker. Um, you know, Creoles really have their own culture in a lot of ways. Um, they also have their own prejudices towards blacks, which is, you know, why it's extremely unique. You know, I can remember times sitting with my grandpa, him, you know, making some pretty questionable remarks and thinking to myself, you're, you're the same color as the people that, you know, you're talking about. And to me, that was insane. You know, my grandpa, you know, one of my favorite people on this earth, well, no longer living, but, you know, growing up was one of my most favorite people and, you know, still is. But, you know, you just look back at the times that he grew up in, um, you know, so much of his feelings and prejudices were based on, you know, laws that were put in place. If anyone knows the one drop rule. Um, you know, if you were considered any bit of black, you didn't get the same voting rights. You, you weren't able to be a property owner, things like that, which, you know, is why, you know, Creoles kind of separated themselves. Um, it's really, really quite interesting, like I said, and a lot of people don't know the history of that. But, you know, looking back, although I was raised to identify as Creole, you know, I know that that's not how the world sees me. You know, it's almost been a facade that 
I've used to hide behind, you know, when racially difficult moments occur. Um, you know, it's taken up really until the last month or so for me to, to come to terms with the fact that, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement, this directly impacts me. You know, it's because of that that I, you know, like to share a few of my own life experiences and um, hopefully some people can kind of learn from them. Um, but uh, yeah, one of the, the most, I would say, formative, formative experiences that I can really remember was uh, my junior year of high school, um, I was asked to the turnabout dance by a girl that I really liked. Uh, she was white, showed up to pictures looking fly, had her corsage, everything ready to go. Uh, my mom had her camera ready, you know, 10 minutes go by, end up waiting, 20 minutes go by, still waiting for her to show up. She never showed. Uh, her friends told me that, you know, she was having some wardrobe issues. I was like, all right, I've got an older sister. I completely understand that. Uh, eventually, you know, she didn't make it to pictures. We met at dinner. Um, it wasn't until the following year that it was a, a friend that was angry with her, ended up spilling the beans to me, uh, learned that uh, she had intentionally skipped the photos because uh, she didn't want her dad to, to find out that she was going to the dance with a black guy. I actually, uh, I ended up telling that story to my dad for the first time. It was two weeks ago when he was up here to visit. And really, you know, I think the, the reason I think about it now too, you know, my wife is pregnant, she's due in August. So I, I just pray that, you know, our future son is not going to have to experience that hurt. You know, that's something that, you know, to this day, you know, sticks with me. Um, I'm sure many other people have gone through simil similar situations, you know, worse, much worse than that. But, you know, that's just one that for me has stuck with me. And um, yeah, I, it's hard, hard to talk about. But at the same time, I feel like it's a story that, that needs to be shared. You know, this is coming from someone that was on the honor roll and, you know, never gotten much trouble at school except for talking too much in class but um, yeah you know I, I think there's a lot of experiences that people have that are similar to that and um, you know, now's the time to talk about them um, you know when I went off to college fresh, freshman year I, I quickly learned that uh, you know I, I better get used to hearing someone yell you know nigger at me when they were in their car as I was walking to class or walking back from the bar um, you know, I went to school my first two years in Carbondale, Illinois, which was uh, an extremely rural area, but you had a, a mix of a lot of inner city Chicago students. So, you know, the demographics were very mixed, but at the same time, you know, there were, there was quite a bit of racial cla clashing, I guess you could say. Um, you know, that's an experience that I told, you know, my, my in-laws about, and, you know, they thought it was absolutely crazy. They see me as, you know, a white man in their eyes, I, I talk the same way, we, you know, I dress the same way as them. Um, so, you know, in a lot of people's eyes, it's, it's crazy to kind of hear those stories. But, you know, for anyone on this that's black or of color, I, I think you can understand you've, you've gone through the same things. And, uh, you know, it's, it's something that needs to be discussed now. Um, you know, in a lot of those times, I've, I've been lucky to have you know, my wife or one of my white friends there to, to step in and speak up for me. Um, I think it's made me realize that, you know, the voice of the majority is really more impactful than that of, you know, the minority. Um, you know, I, I'd love for more to start being comfortable with being uncomfortable in situations of injustice. You know, if it's something as simple as, you know, hearing someone make a, you know, a, I guess an ignorant comment, you know, being okay with, you know, not necessarily calling the person out, but, you know, talking to them on the side and, and having that conversation with them to say, hey, you know, that's not okay to say. Um, you know, there's plenty of proof out there in our, our history to show that, you know, there's an unavoidable glass ceiling for people of color, you know, in our country. And I, I think, you know, these discussions right here, right now are, are what's important. And, um, 
there's there's plenty of you know books out there, documentaries. My wife and I just watched a documentary um, on Netflix rec recently, um, you know, about the Thirteenth Amendment. Um, I think it's called Thirteenth. Uh, but anyways, I I would strongly recommend it for anyone you know looking to to educate themselves and and just learn more about you know some of the systemic racism. So. Um, I'm not sure where we're at on time, but I no, love to, uh, absolutely about to thank you, Brian. Um, yeah, you, you pulled on my heartstrings there. I'm glad that people can't see me right now. <laughs> um, but um, a lot of people have just been like, thank you for just showing that raw emotion. And I believe that Sarah has a question from the panelists she'd like to ask. Yeah, um, Brian, thanks for that. That was, yeah, same thing as Courtney. I found myself tearing up and just just hope that we can be better for our kids. Um, you had a, quite a few people just saying, thanks so much for sharing. I've had a similar experience. Um, thanks for speaking up and whatnot. Um, this question kind of talks about navigating uh, being a leader in a corporate environment as a black mm -hmm. man. Maybe what are things that either you've experienced that you feel extremely proud of to be a part of and or you've seen other companies or employers in the area responding to black lives and what's going on right now? Yeah, absolutely. Um, starting off with my own company, I, I think, you know, there are companies out there that, you know, already do a great job of, you know, diversity and, and inclusion, um, regardless of if you're a great company, you know, on the diversity and inclusion or not, um, you know, recognizing that, you know, there is a movement happening right now. And just recognizing that, you know, whether we're at a good place or a bad place, we can get better. Um, you know, Hex Armor, our, our leadership has gotten behind, you know, the movement and, and wanting to improve on, you know, the diversity of our own company. Um, I think a lot of that comes with just, you know, buy-in from leadership. Um, if you don't have the buy-in from leadership, you know, there's not much that can get done. So I, I would say that's that's the biggest thing. And, you know, I joined Hex Armor a little over about seven months now, and I've been extremely proud to join the company and, you know, really have that support. Um, but, uh, yeah, as far as other companies, you know, I, I went out and asked, you know, a lot of my friends and, and family, you know, what are their companies doing right now as far as, you know, is there, you know, diversity and inclusion groups that you're putting together? Is it, you know, just educating people through, you know, third party? It, and I, I think just acknowledging it is a start. Acknowledging it and then doing what you can. You know, asking people questions. Um, and I, I think that's, that's the biggest start. But, you know, not every company is going to be the same and not every company has to be the same. Uh, the most common question that I've gotten from any of my white friends and colleagues are, you know, I don't want to bring up, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement and really, you know, try to single someone out. I, I think that's a worry, you know, you don't want to single anyone out and make them feel like they're on the spot. But, um, you know, at least for myself and, you know, any of my family and, and Blacks that I've talked to, you get so much respect by just asking you know, someone of color or someone black, you know, how they're doing. It's, it's not singling out. Um, it, it's the complete opposite. It's showing that you care for them. So I, I think that's one way to start. If you don't know how, just ask how you're doing and kind of going from there. Um, and then the book Price of Inequality is a good read to educate yourself. Awesome. 